appreciate you being with us. For our guest, you are honored guest. You are part of the family now. You've been here long enough. Uh, an hour is long enough to be part of the family, right? So that's what becomes part of the family. Let's face it, we're in the country and we're related to everybody, right? So that's the way it goes. Uh, scripture tells me that Eve is the mother of all living. That means you're stuck with me no matter what. Part of us are family. I brought two friends today to help me preach. Uh, this is one of them here. Y'all like rats, right? Well, I like rats. But we'll keep them up here. How about that? That'd be good. They won't go anywhere. Um, this morning was the first morning on for early service that we did uh, canned music, what we call canned music. Videos off the screen, so it only fitting that God would have me preach a message on worship, right? Since we didn't have a worship team up there, I'm like, God, you got a sense of humor. Uh, knowing that the worship team for first service is taking a couple months off, they're getting a break. They uh, they work pretty hard, evidently. I asked them if I could take a break, and they said no. I don't know what the deal is there, but uh, we appreciate all they do, the hard work that they do. So a little different this morning. We're going to talk about learning from the enemy. Now think about this for a minute. How many of you have learned some things from your enemy? Right? How about this one? How many have learned some things from an ex in your life? Reality says that a lot of us learn more on how to be good going through mess than we ever did about someone trying to teach us how to be good. Seven people today. The others are lying and won't admit it, right? How many's ever spent a night in jail? How many learned real quick that's not where you want to be? Amen. <laughs> Can I get a witness? See, we learned something. Kirk got a hang on it. Woo! Didn't take but one night. One night. That's all it took. <laughs> Learning from the enemy. Before David could dance from the Lord, he had to go through a battle. David had to learn before he could actually dance before the Lord. And so for us, I think sometimes as born again children of God, that we, we know everything to do, right? We know how to do it. We do this church thing real well. But I wonder sometimes if we don't become complacent. They say you take for granted the one you love the most. You take them for granted more than anything. I got women looking at me going, uh-huh. That's right. That's right. Men looking at women going, uh-huh. That's right. That's right. This morning I want to talk to you from 1 Samuel. There's a story about some rats in the Bible and some other things which we'll get into. Let me give you a little bit of setup before we get there. Uh, yeah. 1 Samuel chapter 5, the Philistines have taken the Ark of God. This is the place where they meet with God in the temple in the Holy of Holies. Uh, this is where their sins are forgiven. This is where everything is. And the Philistines have stolen the temple or the Ark of God. And they placed it in the house of Dagon or Dagon. However you want to pronounce it, I pronounce it Dagon. Uh, and they literally, uh, they took it and they placed it in there. They got up the next morning. And the God Dagon was laying at the feet of the Ark of the Covenant. I like it when a stone uh, image falls over in front of the power of God. So they set Dagon back up, and the next morning they came in, and Dagon had fallen again right before the temple of God, and his arms and his head had broken off, so there was nothing left but a stump. Now to tell you a little bit about Dagon, what little bit I know about him, uh, they say he invented the plow. He was the god of the harvest. And then his son was Baal, the god Baal. And they worshipped the god Dagon, and they worshipped the god Baal. If you want to look those up and study more, you can. But the scripture says in 1 Samuel 5, 6, that God had pressed heavy on the Philistines, and he had smote them with emeralds, and then it goes on in chapter 6 to tell us with wrath. Now, if you're reading a King James Bible, it says that they, the people were smoked with emeralds. If you're reading an NIV Bible or a different one, it says they were smoked with tumors and rats. If you're reading in the original 
language, it says that they all got hemorrhoids. <laughs> they were all struck with hemorrhoids. Now, I don't want to show of hands who's ever dealt with them, but I'm pretty sure that's not a comfortable thing. <laughs> so the scripture says the Philistines stole the ark of God, and then they were struck with hemorrhoids and with rats. And we know that the great plague was created by rats. Rats cause more damage than anything. Fleas off of rats. Rats are nasty. Have you ever seen the where the science says uh, they serve peanut butter to rats and they die with cancer? Don't eat peanut butter, right? Rats are going to die with cancer. The rats. If you feed them anyway, I'm going off. The plus some butter. I don't like peanut butter. That's the last one I said. I like my peanut butter. But the scripture says that it got so bad that they were ready to do anything to get rid of the hemorrhoids and the rats. Turn them, if you will, to 1 Samuel chapter 6. 1 Samuel chapter 6. Y'all are a quiet bunch this morning. Or maybe I'm quiet. I don't know. And I'm going to read a bunch of scriptures, so I will not ask you to stand this morning, but I do ask you to honor God's Word. 1 Samuel. <laughs> One of those days. First Samuel chapter 6, beginning with verse 1, says, And the ark of the Lord was in the country of the Philistines seven months. Seven months with hemorrhoids. Not good. And the Philistines called for the priest and the diviner, saying, What shall we do to the ark of the Lord? Tell us wherewith we shall send it to his place. And, and they had already sent it from town to town, and everyone got sick everywhere it went. And they said, If you send away the ark of God of Israel, send it not empty, but in any wise return him a trespass offering, then you shall be healed, and it shall be known to you why his hand is not removed from you. Then said they, What shall be the trespass offering which we shall return to him? They answered, Five golden emeralds and five golden mice, according to the number of the lords of the Philistines. For one plague was on you all, and on your lords. Wherefore ye shall make images of your emeralds. I'll just give you a minute to meditate on that one. Uh. Moving right along. Make images of your emeralds and images of your mice that mar the land, and you shall give glory unto the God of Israel. For adventure he will lighten his hand <coughs> from off you, and from off your gods, and from off your land. Wherefore then do you harden, do you harden your hearts as the Egyptians and Pharaoh hardened their hearts when he wrought wonderful among them that they did not let the people go and they departed? Now therefore make a new cart and two milch kine on which thou hast come no yoke and tie the kine to the cart and bring their calves home from them. And the ark of the Lord and lay it, take the ark of the Lord and lay it upon the cart and put the jewels of gold, which you may return him for a trespass offering, in a coffer by the side thereof, and send it away that you may go. And see if it goeth by the way of his own coast to Beth Shemesh, then he hath done us this great evil. But if not, then we shall know that it is not his hand that smote us, it was the chance that happened to us. And the men did so, and they took two milch kind and tied them to the cart, shut up their calves at home. And they laid the ark of the Lord upon the cart, and the coffer with the mice of gold and the images of their emeralds. And the kind took the straight way to the way of Beth Shemesh, and went along the highway, lowering, lowing as they went, and turned not aside to the right hand or the left. And the lords of the Philistines went after them, under the border of Beth Shemesh. And they of Beth were reaping their wheat harvest in the valley, and they lifted their eyes and saw the ark and rejoiced to see it. And the cart came in the field of Joshua, a Beshemite, and stood there where there was the, a great stone, and they claimed the wood of the cart and offered the kind of burnt offering unto the Lord. And the Levites took down the ark of the Lord and the coffer that was with it, wherein the jewels of gold were, and put them on a great stone. And the men of Beth Shemesh offered burnt offerings and sacrificed sacrifices the same day unto the Lord. And when the five lords of the Philistines had seen it, they returned to Ekron the same day. 
Skip down to verse 19. And he smote the men of Bethshemesh because they had looked into the ark of the Lord. Even he smote of the people 50,000 and threescore and ten men. And the people lamented because the Lord had smitten many of the people with a great slaughter. Brother Nelson, will you bless the reading of the word? Father, I have not just thanks for this word, Heavenly Father. Thank you for your care and person and your help to receive your word in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So let's look real quickly at this story, at what the men of God did. Okay? So the Ark of the Covenant has been gone seven months. They're waiting for it to come back, or they're waiting for, for expecting God to do something. And when they see it coming, the first thing they do is they rejoice, right? So we know that we are rejoiced when the presence of God shows up in the house of God, amen? But then they took the cart that it came on, and they busted it up, and then they took the cows, and they slaughtered them and made a sacrifice. Now that sounds good and right. Would you agree? The problem is God told them a certain way to do things. God said, I want you to do things a certain way. And when you do things a certain way, I will bless what you do. But when you do things differently, I will not bless what you do. So the first thing that they did wrong here was they took two female cows. Two female cows, if you will. They did not take bulls. And God said you are to offer a bull on the altar, not cows. And how do we know they were cows? Well, it tells us in Scripture that they locked up their calves and they sent them on their way. Now imagine these two cows. They're crying, they're wailing, but they're going where God told them to go. They're going to take the Ark of the Covenant back. But the people of God didn't do it right. So it literally says that because they did things incorrectly, they looked at the Ark, they knew better, they killed cows that they weren't supposed to and sacrificed them, God killed over 50,000 cows people that day. My question to you today is, are you doing things the way God told you to do them? Let me make that a little bit farther. Are you doing the things that God told you to do? Somewhere along the way, if we're not careful, like the children of Israel, here's what we will find out happens. We get casual in our Christianity. We've been serving God a long time, right? We've been doing this for about 30 years now, so we can coast a little bit, kind of like a marriage. You know, when you first get married, you, you send them a text at lunch, I love you, you're, you're all this stuff, everybody's getting, getting, go, go. Mama always has to get the dinner made when you get home. Everything's the way it is. You know, 25 years later, you get home and you're like, where's dinner? She goes, you want dinner, get in there and cook it yourself. I don't know, what are we having? What are you cooking tonight? Things change. We become casual and we can become lax. The children of God had gotten relaxed, if you will, in the way they worship God. And so they literally were destroyed because they didn't do things in the order that they were supposed to. Now let's look at the enemy. What did the enemy do? And I want you to catch this this morning. And you may think I'm crazy, that's cool. But I want you to catch this this morning saw that the hand of God was on them and that things weren't going well in their lives, they said, we got to send this thing back. And they asked their priest that served their God, not our God, and they asked him, what do we do with this thing? And he said, we send it back, but don't you dare send it back empty handed. Don't you dare send it back without an offering. Don't you dare send it back without an offering. And I see this, and the Lord's been showing me this this week, and I've been studying, I've really been trying to avoid this, but here's what God was showing me. He said, how come the enemy knows that to step into the presence of God, that you are to worship and you are to pray and you are to set forth an offering or a sacrifice, and the men and women of God don't understand the importance and the power and the anointing and the authority that goes with it. How come the enemy knows more about serving God with very little than the children of God? Or let me take that a step further. How come the enemy wanted to get it right and God's people are just wanting to coast through it? And we're talking about the Israelites. We're not talking about the church today. But I wonder sometimes how many of us, our prayer time becomes a backseat thing. I wonder how many of us came in here today ready to worship. By the way, I enjoyed having two different worships this morning. I wish you would have done them all, but I like having two different
different sets from first to second service. That was nine. But the reality is this. How many people came in the door this morning? They brought, they come to the presence of the Lord. They wanted God to do something on their behalf, but their mind was somewhere else. And it takes four songs for them to get ready to start worshiping, and we're done. How come the enemy knows how important worship is, or offering unto God, and we don't? How come the first thing the priest of Dagon said is, I don't know much, but I know this. See, I don't know much about Catholicism, but I know they do this, right? Right? Hail Mary, full of grace, something like that. See, I know a few things. I don't know a lot, but a few things. They didn't know a whole lot about the way the Hebrews worship, but they understood one concept. When you enter into the presence of the king, when you're asking God for something, it might ought to come with worship. An offering of some sort. And if the enemy can say, I'm not going to send this back without an offering. Five golden emeralds and five golden mice. I'm, if I, I'm going to make it cost me something so that God will heal me. And here I am, a child of God for the last 30 years, and I come whining and belly aching and moaning and complaining before God without any worship. Here's what I'm saying to God. My problem is more important than your worship. My problem means more to me than your worship. If the enemy understands how important this is, how come I can't get it? And we do understand it, but why do we allow the enemy to steal our worship? Oh, amen. When's the last time you danced before the Lord in the midst of the storm? When's the last time you got so lost in worship? you forgot about what's going on. When's the last time your prayer time carried over into your favorite show rather than your favorite show carried into your prayer time? You see, we're God's people and we want God to move on our behalf, but He gave us specific ways of doing things. And if we don't do things the way you say, well, it's all under grace now. I said, well, we'll get there in a minute. We'll talk about that one. But what I want you to see this morning is this. That if God says, enter my cage with, gates with thanksgiving and praise, that means, you know what? I ought to enter his gates with thanksgiving and with praise. I ought to thank him that there's air in my lungs. I ought to praise him that I'm still up moving. I ought to thank him that everything that he has given me and praise him for everything rather than saying, God, I want to thank you that I have a vehicle to drive and a roof over my head. I want to thank you that you saved my soul and you filled me with the Holy Ghost. I would rather say, God, why is the chick engine light on? Actually, that's not the line. Mine says airbag. Don't know what happened. That came on yesterday. Figure it out. The enemy said, I need to be healed. And I'm going to offer the best I can to the Hebrew God, our God and see if he will heal me. I want God to heal me, then I'll offer my best. If they knew the order, how come I don't know the order? Learning from the enemy this morning. Let's change that up a little bit. Let's just say learning from the ungodly, not the enemy. Y'all are too quiet. See, here's the thing about us pastors. We understand what God wants us to do. And with that being said, my job, I would love to come in here and make you feel good and giddy every week. But at the end of the day, the truth is this. My job is to help you grow forward. And that's not always good and giddy. Or at least my dad didn't think so when he hit me with that belt. I promise you. It sort of worked all the way, I guess. Jonah chapter 1. I won't read the whole story, but you know the story of Jonah. In verse 16 of Jonah chapter 1, the men are on the boat, and they are not godly men. They are not Hebrews. They're from Tarshish. They are not Hebrews. They are not what Jonah is. Maybe they've seen how the Hebrews worship. Maybe they worship similarly. But similarly, man, look at that word. About the same. How about that? But here's what the scripture says. 
They throw Jonah overboard. And then verse 16 says, Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly and offered a sacrifice unto the Lord and made vows. Now, if you've ever been here on Wednesday nights, you've heard me talk about this. Uh, the scripture says that they were not godly men. The scripture says they were not of the Hebrew faith. But it also says that when they saw the power of God, that they offered sacrifices. The word offer in the original Hebrew language is zabah. And here's what it means. To kill an animal and offer a sacrifice. They did exactly what they had seen and known. They didn't know who God was. They hadn't met him on a personal level. But they knew one thing. They knew what to do first was to worship God. So they offered a sacrifice. And here's what that scripture says. Offered is Zadok. Sacrifice is Zebok. And it literally means a sacrifice righteous to God. Now stay with me for a minute more. I'm not much longer. Men of ungodly descent didn't understand the concept of the God we serve but they understood the ritualistic part of it, and they wanted to do it ritualistically. They wanted to offer a sacrifice to God, and the scripture says that their offering that began unrighteous became righteous before God. Can I say this to somebody in the room today? If you're waiting on feeling goosebumps to dance before the Lord, if you're waiting on a move of God and the anointing to fall on you, you're missing the boat. Here's the nutshell. You ready? Do what you know to do. Do what you know that is right to do. I'm just waiting on the Lord. As soon as I feel the goosebumps, I'm going to dance, I'm going to jump, I'm going to shout. As soon as I feel the... I don't always feel like preaching. I don't always feel like worshiping. So what I'm telling my God is, I will worship you when I feel like. I will give you a sacrifice of praise. And here's what God said. Do what you know to do whether you feel it or not. And I will move on your behalf. The storm ceased. Think about this. The Philistines are fighting against God and yet he heals them because they're faithful in understanding what little bit they know. We are born again men and women and children of God. We know the Word of God inside, outside, upside down. And yet when it comes to the simple things in the Word of God, it's almost like we ignore those, look the other way, and expect God to bless us in the midst of that. Just do what you know to do. You know what I know? I was created to worship God. And when I feel like it, I will, right? What happens when we walk into church ready to worship and we're not caught up in the world but in the, in the fact that, you know what? My life's falling apart. Everything in my life is falling apart out there, but this I know. For the next hour and a half, I'm going to be in the presence of God with men and women of God. And I'm going to give Him praise. When I step back out that door, the jungle's still out there. The problem may still be out there. But He is worthy of my praise. He deserves it. everything that has breath, praise the Lord, right? Two examples from the Old Testament. The Philistines were the enemy. And yet they understood better, or at least applied it better, than the children of God how to serve God. You know what thought comes to mind up there, Stan? Ain't no rock gonna cry out for me. If the Philistines know how to honor God with their, with their gifts, how much more should I know how to honor God with my gift? And the greatest gift I can give him is my worship. Step forward to the New Testament. I don't have an exact scripture, but if you want to read about it, it's in, Genesis, or it's in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. 
And I'm going to read you from a historical book. One quote. Jews have lived in Rome since the 2nd century B.C. Julius Caesar and Augustus supported laws that allowed Jews protection to worship as they chose. Synagogues were classified as colleges to get around Roman laws by the Romans. Banning secret societies and the temple was allowed to collect yearly tax paid by all <coughs> Jewish men for the temple maintenance. In other words, the enemy that held the Jewish people and the country of Israel captive knew that if they allowed their captives to worship God and to go ahead, even if they had to bend the rules a little bit, they were going to have peace. <coughs> if the enemy knows that worship is that urgent to God, how much more should we know? How much more should I know? And I wonder how many times it's been a stench in the nostrils of God by whining and belly aching without ever saying thank you for what I have. My complaining, my fussing, my every... Why do we come to church now and the worship is almost... And I'm not talking about this church, but I'm talking about as a whole. Why is it almost stagnant? Well, bass player couldn't make it to practice, so he didn't get to be up today. That hurts things, right? And then the guitar player, he's on vacation for a few weeks. He's taking a little bit of time off. So that, are, that has nothing to do with my heart. And if I can learn something from the enemy today, I can learn that, you know what? My worship and my time of God ought to be the most valuable thing in my life. I ought to be able to praise God when all hell's breaking loose. And everybody's got hemorrhoids and the rats are overtaking them. <coughs> and yet something in me chooses to put those things on the back burner and focus on the things of this world. David grabs the ox cart. He puts it on 2 Samuel chapter 6. He puts it on a brand new cart because it worked for the Philistines, right? Do you know why the Philistines could haul the Ark of the Covenant on an ox cart and David couldn't? Because they didn't know any better and he did. I know this is hard, isn't it? Not my words, it's his. So no apologies. David put it on an ox cart, takes off down the road, it shakes, someone touches it, who's it touches it, he dies, it sets at Open Eden's house for three months, everything at Open Eden's house is blessed. Here's the thing. God wants to bless his people. He wants them to be blessed. So much that he took two cows, made them leave their children and follow a road going somewhere they've never been before to get his presence back among his people. And when he got to his people, here's what they said. Yeah, we're not going to do it your way, Lord. We're going to do it my way. Just do what you know to do. Well, I'm waiting on the Lord to move. No, you're not. You're choosing to not move. Do what you know to do. If you don't know a whole lot about God's Word, do what you know to do. Do what you know to do. And that's what the enemy has taught me this week. Literally studying this as God says, Oh my God, I want to know where to go next. I want to know what to move. He said, Just do what you know to do. And I'm saying, God, I want to move with you like never before. Do what you know to do. Do what you know to do. Not what you want to do, but do what you know to do. They didn't come back to get the Ark of the Covenant. And the scripture said they took six paces. They carried it with new staves. They set it down. Nobody touched it. And he danced before the Lord. And God released a blessing on Israel. Do you think that there's any possibility that America's in the shape that it's in because God's people refuse to follow God's plan? Amen. Yeah. yeah.
many times has the enemy stolen your worship? How many times has the enemy stolen your worship? And I think about this. Let's be honest. Let's, let's be honest. I know, I know. Mikey, you should probably put a clock up there. Um, forgot my watch again. Amazing. I wear it on. You can see how much I wear it, right? Except on Sundays. <laughs> God says, I want to bless you. Do it this way. And we go, God, I got a better plan. God, I got a better plan. God, if you'll bless me, I'll worship you. And he said, I've already blessed you. Worship me, and I'll pour out more. Do what you know to do. The enemy understood what to do. When the world was coming against them, Hey, give an offering to the Most High God, right? Boats falling apart, give an offering to the Most High God. And God said to become righteous before Him. Think about this. Think about this. Think about men that didn't know Him. That they began to do the ritual, all they knew. And God said it became righteous before Him. Zebot became, became Zebot. What about the next time you don't feel like worship? Your hip hurts too bad. But you get to church five minutes early, not 15 minutes late. Because that, that really, you know, that's what fires up the anointing of God, showing up 20 minutes late. He loves that. Just walking away. I'm just teasing, smiling. <laughs> what about when you don't feel like it and you go, God, there's nothing in me. My heart is broken. My body is aching. I feel like I'm going to kick my guts out, but you're worthy of my praise. And this might be the last chance I ever get. And I'm not going to miss it. I'm going to worship you, Lord. And all of a sudden, his presence begins to infiltrate your body. And your lip begins to free up a little bit. And all of a sudden, you know, the headache's not there and your stomach's not upset anymore. And all of a sudden, God says, you know what? You honored me. I'm going to honor you. I'm going to honor you. What happens when our worship becomes a priority? That's the way the enemy figured it out. You say, boy, that's a stretch. I don't care what you think. Here's what I know. If God's people will do it God's way, you're begging God to bring your family back, start thanking Him for bringing them back. trying to beg God to fix your finances, start honoring Him with your finances. Amen, Tom? Amen. 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 You want God to heal your body? The hemorrhoids are driving you crazy? You have a set down in four weeks? Well, if you're standing anyway, why don't you just go ahead and give Him some praise? The enemy understood that. I learned more from horrible relationships than I ever have from good. You're saying, uh -huh. what's that say about Wendy? I can treat her better now because of what I went through. If you're waiting for God to move on your behalf, maybe it's time you start doing what you know to do. Maybe it's time you start letting go of some addictions. Maybe it's time you start worshiping when you don't feel like it. Maybe it's time you start doing something different. You know what one simple thing in my life has nothing to do with you whatsoever? Taking about a six-week break from Facebook. Because every time I picked up my phone, if the Dodgers weren't playing, the first thing I'd do was hit the Facebook app just see what's going on in everybody's life. Do you see a Facebook app on that phone? For me, every time I think I should look and see what's going on on Facebook, I know it's time to pray. That has nothing to do with you, but I know what I need to do. And let's be honest, you know what you need to do. 
Some of you, you need to let go of that pornography or that addiction or whatever that thing is. You, need, you know the right thing to do. For others of you, you look at your bills and you say, I can't afford to give God his percent. I just don't have it. And God said, if you'll give me my percent, I'll bless the other 90 to the point where you won't have to stress anymore. For some of us, we need to worship in the midst of our storm. Because God wants to calm the storm. He wants to restore and put back. The enemy knew he would have peace in his life if he allowed the Hebrews to worship. So all this time that they crushed and destroyed the Hebrew people, Rome understood if I let them go to church, they're going to submit to everything else I want to do. You know what they knew? That as long as they continued to honor God, everything would be all right. Church, it's time we start saying this to ourselves. I just got to do what I know to do. Period. Well, as soon as God tells me, He's already told you. Well, what about the next thing? I don't know. Keep doing what He told you till then. If God told you to build an altar in your house and you still ain't got it, go home and build it. If God told you to worship Him with reckless abandon and you're sitting there sipping on your thumbs, time to get up and start moving. I don't believe we're going to see a move of God until God's people move to see Him move. It's changed, don't it? It stinks to think that I'm holding back my miracle. It stinks, Vicki, to think that I'm the cause that I haven't got my miracle. And I don't have to alter that today. I don't have to alter, alter that today. Put my God above my job. Put my God above my family. Put my God above my finances. Put my God above my healing. Put my God above everything and say, God, you said take six steps, although I think it's foolish, and then dance before you, you're about to see some crazy dance going on. Because this week he showed me, and there's more, I'm not going to go there, but he showed me over and over and over <coughs> what he wants to do for his people, but he's waiting for his people to do what they know to do. Can we give him praise in the house? trying to justify, twist, and manipulate your word to fit my need. Let my worship be worthy of who you are. Let my prayer time be worthy of who you are and the time you deserve. Let me be a bride that pleases you in all things. God, I pray somehow today that you stir the hearts of your people, that we would do what we know to do, even if it doesn't fit our schedule. God, then I ask you, as you've always done, to pour out on your people. God, let us be obedient to you, and then you pour out. There's one here today who does not know you as Lord and Savior. I pray that they find you today. If there's
there's one here today, Lord, that is backslidden, that they would return. If they need filled with the Holy Ghost, let that be today. But God, I pray for the body of Christ, as I have for the last few weeks, that we would come back to your standard, that we would return to holiness, that we would redig, we would rewalk until we see the revival that you promised. Don't let us fall by the wayside. Let us be on the forefront of what you're about to do. In your precious and holy name. Altars are open. If you have a need, if you have a walk, come talk to Jesus.